Good morning, church. You ever have one of those moments where you feel like you've been gone forever, but it's just been a week? That's kind of the way it's been for us. We took a little time off with our family this week. Last Sunday, right after the service, we hightailed it to San Antonio to spend some time there and then came back and then through Wednesday kind of had some quality time with our kids and then my wife and I were able to get away for a few days. We actually got a great deal to go to Florida and I hate the beach but I love my wife and she loves the beach but we had a great time just relaxing uh, but it's been great. I feel like I've been gone for forever but I didn't even miss last Sunday like that. I mean what a preacher. You know what I'm saying? Like total... <laughs> Like, plan your vacation around church time, that's unbelievable, right? If you have your Bible, let's turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Um, I also want, we're going to go later to the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, if you want to mark your spot there. But I mentioned earlier that my family and I drove to San Antonio last Sunday, and my kids, we have a, a season passes to Six Flags, and so we're going to take the kids there. We love riding roller coasters. I love it. It's a, it's a lot of fun, and so... We decided we're going to spend the night in San Antonio, and, and uh, we had our season passes. But about halfway there, I told my wife, I said, you know what? It's October, and they're probably going to have, like, Fright Fest at, the, at Six Flags. And I just tell you, I'm not a fan, okay? Not a fan for a lot of reasons, uh, but one of the reasons, and it's not the top on my list, but one of the reasons is I don't like to be scared at all, Okay. Now, I like to jump out and scare people. That's fun. But if you do that to me, I cannot be responsible for me laying hands on you. I don't like being scared. And so we were there. The kids were riding some of the rides. And then Ellie wanted to ride the train. Ellie's not a fan of roller coasters. And so I said, well, I'll take you over there to the train. And so we go wait for the train. And the person gets on the, on the microphone and says, well, uh, the train is going to close at 6.20 for the arrival. And I thought, okay, I don't know what that is. But we were there in time, and so we were able to ride it around. And we got back to the train station right at 6.20. And then I looked out at the board right in front of the train station that explained what the arrival was. And they bring all the scary people <laughs> on the train back to that train station where we were standing in about 20 minutes. And I said, we will not be here when that happens, period. We're not here for the arrival. The only arrival I'm looking forward to is the arrival of Jesus, my King. Amen? But I don't want any part of that scary stuff. When I was a youth pastor, I used to start every lock-in the same way. I would give the kids all the same speech, that we don't do any PDA, no public displays of affection. We don't do PDA, private displays of affection. And I would tell the kids, always stay in the light. And the reason is... Bad things happen in the dark. Can I get a witness in this room? You probably have some stories of bad things that happen in the dark in your life. And, and today, that's essentially what Paul is going to tell us in this next section of the book of Ephesians. I want us to actually begin in Ephesians 5 and verse 8, read a few scriptures, then kind of recap where we've been in this series. But in Ephesians 5... In chap, uh, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 8, I want you to listen to what Paul writes. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Here's the key imperative right here. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. If you want some great verses to memorize, you should memorize these because it tells us about our identity. It tells us about our behavior. It tells us about who we were and who we are now and what God has called us to do. Now, throughout these last three chapters of the book of, of Ephesians, Paul has used this phrase walk or this walking in on numerous occasions. You'll recall in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he told them to walk worthy of their calling. In Ephesians 4, 17, he, he reminded the believers that they are to no longer walk as the Gentiles do. They are not to walk as their pagan culture around them was walking and living. What John preached last week or two weeks ago was that we're called in Ephesians 5 and verse 2 to walk in love. If you look down in chapter 5 at verse 15, which is what we're going to study next week, 
He tells them to look carefully at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. But here in verse 8, he tells us to walk as children of light. It's considering every step that you take. When he uses that word walk, it means the way that you live or your lifestyle. It is your daily walking in life. That's the essence of that phrase that's used throughout this, uh, this text in this, in this book. Now, since we started this series called We Are Family, we've taken a look at a few topics. I want to kind of catch you up for those that missed. But Paul referenced that all the teaching from really the end of chapter 3 through chapter 6 is about the church. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21, Paul wrote to him, Be glory in the church through Christ Jesus or in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. But then at the end of chapter 5 and verse 32, he tells us, this is the mystery that's profound, but I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. So Ephesians 3.21, unto him be glory in the church. Ephesians 5.32, I'm talking about Christ in his church. And everything in the middle of that is about God receiving glory in and through the church, which is our family in Christ. And so we've made a few points as we've walked through this. In Ephesians 4 and verse 3, we discovered that a united family is a strong family. That we are to stand firm in one spirit. And then we found in Ephesians 4 and verse 7 that God has given a diversity of gifts in the local body. And that diversity is actually a gift from God. That in the church, unity is not uniformity. We all have different gifts, but we're to use those gifts to serve one another. I saw this last week, and I, I didn't ask for permission to share this, but Alexis Lynn last week had an issue with her back. That was really hampering her. And I texted Jason Sigler, who's a chiropractor. said, hey, would you mind just taking a look at her? And, and he did and helped her out because they were leaving town that, that night. And I was texting Jason later and I said, man, thank you so much just for taking time to do that and to give of yourself. And he said, no problem. And, and what he affirmed is exactly what we find in the scripture. And that is that God has given me a gift for this. And I want to use that to serve other people. And that's what we have in the body of Christ, a diversity of gifts, but we use those for God's glory. And then in Ephesians 4, 24, we said that the church of Christ should reflect the character of Christ. Paul said, put off the old self, put on the new self, which was renewed after the image of God to live in righteousness and holiness. And then John spoke a few weeks ago that in the church, in the church family, we're to walk in love. We are to love one another in the way that Christ has loved us. So I want us to look at Ephesians 5 today, really like the first 13 or 14 verses. But I want to go back and pick up where John left us in that last message in this series. Notice in verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. To be imitators is more than merely following Jesus. It's more than merely following God. It is actually mimicking him. It is becoming like him. It's like the game Simon Says, right? Simon Says, stand up. What do you do? You stand up. Simon Says, sit down. You sit down. And what Paul is saying is that we should be imitators of God, that we should be living our lives in such a way that it is mimicking the heart of our father. You ever had your kids around the house and you're fixing something out in the garage and you're using a hammer and nails and what do your kids want to do? They want hammer and nails and so you get a piece of wood and you put some nails in it and you let them kind of go to town on it, right? That's the idea of being an imitator. It's doing exactly what you see the Father doing and what the Father is asking you to do. And so God is glorified in the church when we walk in love. And he says in verse 2, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Within the church family, we're to love as Christ loves, imitating God with Christ-like love, with forgiveness, not letting anger fester, forgiving one another, words that give grace. Now, if you've ever played the game Simon Says, then you know that you do whatever follows Simon Says. But... If you don't follow or somebody says something that doesn't say Simon says at the beginning and you do that, then what happens? You're eliminated. We're called to be imitators of God in verse 1. And then in verse 2, we're to walk in love 
And we're to walk in love in the same way that Christ loved us. Well, how did he love us? He gave himself as a sacrifice for us. And that means within the church family, we're to love one another with that same sacrificial love, willingness, with a willingness to put others above self. But look at verse 3 at the first word. What is it? But. This is when Simon didn't say to do it, right? Verse 1, imitate God. Simon says, right? Do what God says. Do what God does. Verse 2, love as Christ loves. But in verse 3, there's an indication that what's about to be said is contrasted with what was said previously. Notice what Paul writes. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Now, if you're a believer in Christ in this room today, that verse makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we wouldn't expect the Bible to read, verse 1, be imitators of God, and verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved, and then verse 3 to say, and walk in sexual immorality, impurity, or covetousness. Your choice. That would not make sense, does it? That would not be right. It's so obvious that verse 3 is so true. Imitate God, walk in love, but these three things, sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness, must not once be named among you because it's not fitting or proper for that to be named among saints. It kind of calls into our minds what Paul had said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20. When he talked about the pagan culture around them, he told the believers, this is not how you learned Christ. You are not to live your life in a way that is congruent or that is similar to the world around you. So Paul says in verse 3, these three things should not be named among you as is proper. And I want to focus for just one moment on the last word of verse 3, the word saints. Now, if you know anything about, about Paul's story, when Paul became a believer in the book of Acts, that story is found in Acts chapter 9. Paul was on the road to Damascus. He saw the great light, and he met Christ on the road and called him Lord. That was his moment of conversion when he became a believer in the resurrected Christ. And not long after that, Barnabas took Paul to Antioch. And I want to read a scripture to you. It'll be on the screen in, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him... Barnabas brought Paul to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called what? Christians. Now, the word Christian simply means to be Christ-like. It was a word that was used to kind of be a marker for those who considered themselves followers of Jesus Christ. Now, who was in Antioch? Paul. And he was discipled there for how long? For a year. And what were they first called in Antioch? They were called Christians there. That was what was used to mark those believers in Christ. So during Paul's formative years as a believer, they were called Christians. But in all of Paul's writings in the New Testament, how many times did Paul refer to believers as Christians? None. Not one time did Paul, when he wrote letters to Ephesus or Galatia, or to the Corinthians, he didn't call them to all the Christians who were in Ephesus, to all the Christians who were in Galatia, to all the Christians in Corinth. And that would have made sense if he would have just adapted to what they were called by the culture. But in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3, Paul uses the word saints. And in his writing, that is the word that Paul used to refer to his people more than any other, is the word saints. And there's a reason for that. In verse 3, that word saints is hagios in the Greek. And it means sacred, holy, and blameless. It would be used to denote things that were consecrated or set apart for a special purpose. You'll recall if you look back in Ephesians 1 and verse 4 that Paul talks about as believers who we are in Christ. He wrote, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, and here's the word, holy and blameless before him. That word holy in Ephesians 1, 4 
is the same word in Ephesians 5, 3 that is translated saints. Often through scripture you will find the word hagios. It is translated holy or it is translated saints. So in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3, I want you to hear this. He says to the believers, sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness must not ever be named once among you because that is not proper among God's holy ones. Do you hear it? God chose us before the foundation of the world. That means before the world was ever formed, God knew that man would sin. God made a way for man to escape, and that way was Jesus. God knew that you would sin. God knew that you would need a Savior, and he sent Jesus, and he chose you before the foundation of the world, but he did not choose you so that you could just be eternally happy people celebrating with all that God has given us. He has called you. He has chosen you. He has redeemed you to be a holy people. To be saints, as Paul refers to them throughout his letters. God chose you to be holy. Look down in Ephesians 5 at verse 25. We're going to study this in just a few weeks. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Listen to this. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she might be holy and without blemish. That word holy there in verse 27, same word in Ephesians 1, 4, when we are called to be holy people, same word that's translated saints in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. Here's the point. God has called us and chosen us to be a holy people. And Jesus gave himself for us so that he might present to himself a people who are holy. Do you catch it? We are called to be a holy people of God. And that's why in verse 3 of Ephesians 5, Paul tells us that sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness is not proper among saints who are God's holy, sacred, set-apart people. Now, that word sexual immorality, as we find those two words in the English language, it actually comes from one root word in the Greek, one word, porneo, which, from which we get our word pornography. And it is any sexual act, some translations render that word fornication, it's any sexual activity that is outside of God's prescribed bond of husband and wife in marriage. He says any sexual activity outside of marriage is not to be named among the people. Impurity, the same baseless desires and uncontrolled appetites. And then there's that word covetousness, which kind of seems like it doesn't fit, doesn't it? Like sexual sin, sexual sin, and then coveting. Why would Paul put that word covetousness or covetous people in verse 3? All of these sins show our fallen nature. And that is an uncontrolled appetite. What was the first sin on the earth? Adam and Eve. God places them in the garden. Of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but of the one tree you can't eat of it. And what did Satan tempt Adam with? The one thing that he couldn't have. Covetousness. Do you see it? Who cares that you have all these hundreds of trees, thousands of trees, however many there were. You just focus on the one thing you don't have, and that's where you'll find satisfaction. It is the most base of sins in a Christian's life. So we find here in verse 3 that those who commit sexual sin and covet desire to satisfy their appetite by taking what does not belong to them. And he says... This must not be named among you as God's holy people. But then he continues in verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. The sins of the tongue. Let me ask you this question. 
What do your words tell you about what's in your heart? You ever said something and then say, and said, oops, I didn't mean to say that. You ever said that? You realize that's a lie, right? You did mean to say it. Nobody moved your lips. Nobody caused the air to pass through your vocal cords. You said it because you meant it in the moment. Oftentimes what we mean by that is not, I didn't mean to say it. We mean that I should not have said that. What I said was hurtful. What I said was wrong. But every word that comes out of your mouth, Jesus said, is a window into your soul. So what do your words tell you about your heart? I was having a conversation with one of my kids. And they were trying to text a friend to make some plans. And I, as a parent, was trying to confirm the plans because I'm basically an unpaid Uber driver. <laughs> right? And not even told thank you for it. You know what I'm saying? But we're not be bitter about it. And so he's texting and texting, and, and the friend's not responding. And so I said, well, why don't you call them and ask them, because I need an answer. And he's like, whoa, call them? I'm like, yeah, like call them. You know, like, like push that, that, that phone thing and call them. He's like, oh, well, we don't call. Let me text again. So I'm like, you can't call this person and, like, get their attention, maybe the ringing. And it's like, I mean, it's unthinkable. So for all the young people in the room, what do your texts? Reveal about what's in your heart. What are the things that you're communicating, telling you about your heart? Jesus said in Luke 6, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Everything that you say, everything that you communicate, everything that you text to someone is an indication of what's in your heart. So Paul says in Ephesians 5 and verse 4, what you are saying should be proper among those who are God's holy people. This is a great quote by Warren Wiersbe, a pastor. In one of his messages on this passage, he said this, two indications of a person's character are what makes him laugh and what makes him weep. What are the kind of jokes that you tell? What are the kind of the things that you allow to come out in your heart and in your life? What do your words tell you about what's in your heart? And Jesus says the answer to that is everything. Your words will tell you everything that you need to know about what's inside of you. In the middle of verse 4 in Ephesians 5, we find this language that's similar to verse 3 when he said these things are not proper among saints... Paul says in verse 4, there's a certain kind of language that is out of place. It's not fitting for those who call themselves follower, followers of Jesus Christ. Imagine for a moment at the Brook Church that you invited a friend to come to a church function, whether it's a service or maybe a community group, maybe a youth event, and your friend comes and the pastor stands up on Sunday morning and I begin a stand-up comedy routine. And I'm dropping F-bombs up here. Would your friend think that's appropriate for a church service? Even the unbelieving world knows there is language that should not be coming out of the mouths of those who are followers of Christ. And if I'm standing up here on stage and I'm telling all kind of sexual jokes to make everybody laugh, or I put some memes up on the screen that are funny, but they're sexual in nature. Paul says those things ought not be among believers. That what comes out of our mouths should be things that are appropriate. In fact, he says at the end of verse 4, forget all the foolish, silly buffoonery. That's one of the words there for silly talk. He says, and rather, let's offer up thanksgiving. That's appropriate for God's holy people. To give praise and thanks to God for all that we have in Him. So what we say should be noticeably different from the world. Why? Because we're God's holy, set-apart, sacred people. We are not who we were before we met Christ. There should be a change in our lives when Christ comes in. In fact, Paul tells them in verse 5, For you may be sure of this, and listen to this warning, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, 
has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That qualifier there is so powerful. When you covet, you're an idolater. And many times we're not idolizing what we're coveting. We are idolizing ourselves. Remember when they were tempted in the garden, what did Adam say? They saw the fruit that it was good for them, that it would open their eyes. They weren't looking and saying, man, that fruit itself looks delicious. They were doing it and coveting what was not theirs because of what it would bring to them. And verse 5 is a stern warning. That those who are sexually immoral and impure and covetous will not inherit God's kingdom. Now listen, this is one of those verses where we like to say, well, yeah, but what it really means is this. No, it, it really means what it says. The idea in this passage is those who continue to practice these things. And notice what he says in verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. I want you to turn back to Ephesians 2 just for a moment. Paul uses a phrase there that he had used earlier in the book. In verse 1, he tells them, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, he's talking about the past, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. You were sons of disobedience, but God. Right? This is who you were in darkness, but God. You were dead in your sins, but God. And look down to verse 10 of Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To good works. God called you to be holy and he saved you by Christ to redeem to himself a holy people who are doing the good that God has called them to do. So let me ask you this. Does the work of your hands reflect the handiwork of God? Are the things that you are doing in your life reflecting the handiwork of God in you? Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, past tense, some of you. But you were washed, sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here's what Paul is saying. You are no longer the children are sons of disobedience. You are God's holy people set apart to live as God's saints and holy ones. As one pastor put it, he said, a Christian is not sinless, but he does sin less and less. As God's spirit is at work in you as a child of God and not as a son of disobedience, his, his spirit will conform you into the image of Christ. So Paul continues in Ephesians 5 and verse 7. Therefore, do not become partners with them. If you owned a business and you had someone that wanted to partner with you in that business, would you just blindly give that person all your money and say, yeah, let's partner up? No, you would vet that person. You would vet their business experience and their record. You would run background checks. You'd make sure that this person wasn't bankrupt or had stolen money in the past or whatever. You would vet that person. When I was a kid, young person, I'd ask my parents, well, my friends are going to go to a movie. Can I go? You know what my parents' first question was? What's it rated? 
Not who's going. I want to know what it's rated first. And I'd say, well, it's PG-13. And I'm 18. I'm an adult. And I'd argue with my parents about it. And that's when my mom would tell me something that I didn't really understand. I still kind of don't. But she would say, I don't care if his parents tell him to jump off a cliff. You're not going to that movie. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what the cliff has to do with that. <laughs> but her point was simply this. As your parent, my responsibility is you. And I am not going to allow you to go see something and be with people who would encourage you to see or to do something that is contrary to what God has said in his word. So they can jump off cliffs if they want to, but you're not going to go see that movie. I had a conversation with my son. And in my time in high school, I played football, played basketball, played baseball. And I had people that I would work together with on a team to accomplish the goal of winning a game. But I was not out with them on Friday nights at the parties. I was not out with them on Saturday night doing the things that they wanted to do and getting drunk and doing all the things that they wanted to do and asked me to do. And the very simple reason was I was not going to partake in those things that were contrary to what God has said in his word. And that's exactly what Paul had said in verse 7. Do not become partners with them. I cannot tell you the number of people whose marriages have struggled with one business trip. And that's where it started. I can't tell you the number of people that I've counseled where something happened in their life that was catastrophic that started with one conversation with someone they should not have been partnering with. And that's why there's a strong warning here. Do not become partners with them. It's more than guilt by association. It's more than that. It's a guilt by partnership. And Paul simply tells us, do not link arms with people who are going to lead you contrary to where God wants you to go. So in verse 7, don't become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That first word of verse 8 was 4. It connects with the imperative of verse 7. Don't become partners with them for. And in verse 8, he tells us our identity. Listen to this and listen well. He says, you are light. You are light in the Lord. That's who you are. And your identity should be reflected in your behavior. Walk as children of light. Jesus in John 1 and verse 4 was called the light of men. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9, he says, As we walk as children of light, the fruit of our lives will be the better trinity, not sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. Notice, it'll be things that are good and right and true, things of moral excellence, things of righteous behavior and things that are trustworthy, truthfulness, honesty, and integrity. When we walk as children of light, we show the light of Jesus Christ that lives in us. And so write this down. Walking as children of light displays the goodness of God. In verse 10, it reminds me of, as a parent. He says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Sometimes as a parent, you tell your kids something and you can tell in the moment you said it, they don't believe you. You can also tell when their heart is set on rebelling against whatever you just told them. Amen, parents? You just know. And so we have this saying. I'm going to teach it to you today. It's a great saying for all you parents out there. It, it'll annoy your kids to death. I say it all the time. But what happens is I will tell my kids something, and I know that they don't believe what I'm saying. But then later on, what I said is exactly what happens. Isn't that that's an amazing feeling, isn't it? <laughs> Because when, when I'm wrong, we don't worry about those. But when I'm right, that's when we really want to, hey, I just want you to know. And here's the saying, ready for it, change your life. I tell my kids, listen, I know you doubted me in that, but it doesn't matter what time of year it is. If I say it's Christmas, hang your stockings. It's a great line. It'll annoy them to death. I, if, it's, if I say it's Christmas, hang your stockings. Yeah, it's July. It don't matter. Put the stocking up by the fireplace, right? 
In verse 10, for us, knowing what is pleasing the Lord is found in his word. Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. That verse 10, he's talking about prove what is acceptable to God. If you want to know what is acceptable to God, the worst advice you can receive, especially you young people, is follow your heart. Oh, do not follow that advice. Because your heart will lead you to places that you don't, you shouldn't go. If every, ch if every child in this church had their way and had their heart's desire, they would eat cotton candy for breakfast, cotton candy for lunch, and then maybe not dots for dinner. Amen? I saw you debating that online this week. They would eat candy and have Lucky Charms every day. And with Lucky Charms, they wouldn't even eat the wheat sugar part. They would only eat the marshmallows. Don't follow your heart. Don't follow your feelings. The idea in verse 10 is to discern. It's testing or proving to learn by clear and convincing evidence what is truly honoring to God. What God says to us in his word is, if I say it, that is true. And when you walk as children of light, you actually help discern the will of God in your life and for others. So walking as children of light helps us discern the will of God. Very quickly, look at verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, underline this, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I don't have time to give you all that's in these verses, but I want to look down to verses 13 and 14 and focus there for a moment. Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 60. I want you to find that spot in your Bible very quickly. Isaiah 60 is a messianic prophecy. And many believe in verse 14 that Paul is actually quoting a hymn that was present in the early church that was based upon what Isaiah said in Isaiah 60 and verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In Isaiah 59 and verse 20, there's a promise of a redeemer. A redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Remember in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was in Nazareth in the synagogue, and he picked up one of the scrolls, and he began to read from that scroll. Do you know where he read from? Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. And he said to them in their, in their presence, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus, in his hometown, gave the scroll back to the person in charge and he sat down and he said in Luke 4 and verse 21, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In Isaiah 60 and verse 2, the prophecy of the Messiah said, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and the nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Here's what I want you to see. Isaiah, in Isaiah 59, 60, and 61, prophesied about the coming Savior prophesied about the kingdom of the Messiah, which, by the way, is one of the reasons, as believers in Christ, we stand with Israel. That's why we stand with God's people, because it's prophesied that they would bring the Messiah, and it is through their reign and through their kingdom for eternity that we will find the blessedness of God. And in this prophecy, he said that the light of the Jewish people, the Messiah, would shine upon the nations, all the Gentiles, and the Savior would, would rise and show the glory of God. And in this prophecy, we find that Jesus is the glory of God that rose. Jesus is the Redeemer. Jesus is the healer of the brokenhearted. Jesus is the light that would shine upon all the nations that allows every Gentile in this room to be a part of God's family. In this prophecy about the Messiah, we find Jesus. Now look back in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. I want you to focus on the last phrase there in quotations. As Paul 
quotes from that passage in Isaiah 60. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Now I want your eyes on your Bible, and I want you to read verse 14 again, that phrase I just read. And while you're reading that, I'm going to read verse 8 to you. And I want you to listen for the similarity of the story. So you read that quote in verse 14, and I'm going to read verse 8. Are you ready? For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Do you see the similarities? Verse 8 is a description of your life. You were in darkness, but now you're in the light of the Lord. And in verse 14, Paul tells us exactly how that happened for us. We were sleepers. We were dead. And we were resurrected from our dead, our, our death in trespasses and sins. How? Christ shined upon you. Here's what I want you to see. In verse 8, after that description of your life, Paul says, now walk as children of light. This verse is your story as a believer in Christ. Jesus came and shined the light of God's goodness in the world. You saw the light and God brought you from death to life. You were darkness, but now you are light. You were dead and now you're awake. So walk as children of light. And when you walk as children of light, you expose the darkness. When you walk as children of light, you display the goodness of God. When you walk as children of light, you discern or prove what the will of God is. And when you walk as children of light, the light of God's gospel shines. And through your life, you declare to every dead person around you, awake from your slumber and Christ will shine upon you. You want to know what it takes to lead someone to Christ? Walk as children of light. And that walk will declare unto them the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we walk as children of light, we display the goodness of God. We discern the will of God. And we declare the gospel of Christ. So I want to encourage you today, believers, to walk as children of of light. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for the truth of your word and we thank you for the light of the gospel that reached our hearts. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus. And I pray that you would help us to be a people who walk as children of light. I pray that you would help us as we live our lives as parents before our kids that they would see the light of Christ shining in us and through us. And that through our lives, we would declare your goodness to the world. That we would help people to understand what your will is for their lives. And that by shining the light, you would use our lives to expose the darkness. And may that be true of our lives, God. May our, may our lives simply shine the light of Jesus to show others their need for him so that they can awake and arise out of their slumber and come to Christ. So I pray for any person today that as we've studied the scripture, sees an area of their lives, whether it's their thought life, or maybe they're acting out in some appetite that's uncontrolled. If there's language that they're using, whether it's texting someone, things that are inappropriate, or the things that we laugh at, that you would reveal those things to us today and convict us so that we can walk as children of light. Change us where we need to change so that we might change the world around us and give us strength that we'll need to walk as children of light. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.